Welcome to Café Rollist. Or oh, yeah, it's supposed to be weekly, but this week we've got twice of uh, two episodes. Uh, we had Willman uh, about a live Kickstarter, and today we have someone about an actual play show, but also a Kickstarter which was live a year ago, I believe. Greg, could you introduce yourself to our viewers? Yeah, uh, I'm Greg Leatherman. Uh, I wrote a game. Uh, and kickstarted a game called Glitter Hearts, which is a magical transforming heroes RPG. Um, I did that. But it was a year ago. Yeah. Wow. This is not prepared for that to have been a year ago. Uh, and then I also do a podcast called Very Random Encounters. It's an actual play podcast where we randomize everything, characters, names, places, plot lines, the whole thing. And then we play to see what happens. Yeah, and as I was saying to Greg, we got a guest interview in A Plant, which is overgrowing my library, so now it's peeking uh, into the webcam. Yeah, I, I was checking the, the Kickstarter for Glitter Heart to have a, a feel of where you were uh, with it. And uh, yeah, uh, around September, it said 12 days to go uh, till the end uh, of the Kickstarter. Yes. So, where uh, I. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. I, I, yeah, I've never Kickstarted before so <laughs> it was my first ever kickstarter and that is just that is just a process <laughs> that you're never really prepared for how that goes well it's it seems like you you manage quite well at least on the public side of things because it's a uh, you funded quite quite well from what i believe i mean I, i've heard quite a bit of glitter heart i haven't played it yet myself so so congratulations! Uh, one year, one year too late. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, yeah, it it did a lot better than I expected, seeing as it was my first ever actual published RPG. So I had no sort of sense of what I was going to do or how this was going to work. Um, so it's been it's been exciting like I got an any spotlight award for it and a lot of people like it and it's still weird to have people play my game without me being there because for most of its life I was involved in running it and playing it and watching it and testing it so now that people have it and I like I love hearing people play it but it's still that sort of weird experience of I wasn't there to watch what you were doing I don't know how your game went uh, but you seem to be having fun, so that's great. Well, yeah, it's you know I I'm planning right now my first Kickstarter, and uh, yeah, the, the the step where I am right now is I'm trying to to compile a, a quick start version of the rules to start sharing with other people as part of the dev development, and the idea of yeah people running it without me is uh, mm -hmm. it's it's quite weird. Uh, it's exciting, but it's. Yeah, well, is it gonna work or or not? Uh, I mean, I was already pleasantly surprised by the the reception from players I ran it for. So so yeah, so yeah. First one, wh why? How did you get yourself into the trouble? <laughs> so it started because a group of friends wanted me to run uh, a Sailor Moon type game. And so I was looking for a system or a game that I liked, and I didn't find any. So then I said to them, oh, I'll just write some quick rules for it. And then uh, seven months into the writing process, I'm like, okay, this has gone way beyond what I had originally planned for <laughs> just running it for friends I should maybe see if this is something that other people like um, so then I was playtesting it and running around and people really really liked it and then I was like okay do I just write an actual game is this like going to be a thing I'm going to do and I did I decided sure I'll write it a lot of people seem to enjoy it it's got a market that I can I think exists out there um, but I don't ha I don't have money to make a game. <laughs> like I don't have money to do. Like I can't just make this thing and hope it sells. Uh I need help. Um so that's why I said okay, well let's try this whole Kickstarter thing. 
which requires no money, no effort, no, not no. too much work. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, it requires a lot of effort, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Um, and there's not a lot of help out there. There's not a lot of people who are like, hey, this is how you do a Kickstarter. This is what really works. Um, but yeah, so I decided I'll see if I can kickstart the game. Um, and I was overwhelmed because uh, I think I funded on the third day and then everything after that was are we going to meet stretch goals um, but yeah the whole Kickstarter process is so stressful in <laughs> that like the first week is really exciting and then there's nothing until the last 48 hours <laughs> and then the last 48 hours is like this super crazy time when people are canceling or adding in and you're just you have no idea where you're going to end up um so yeah it's it's hard those middle weeks are super hard where you're just like is anybody anybody seeing my stuff is it but so many people save it to see if it's going to fund and then they'll come back and and uh pledge if they know it's going to happen and a lot of people who just pledged to make sure it would happen who then in the last 48 hours canceled because, oh, you're well over and you don't need my money. Yeah, it's a whole thing. Kickstarter is just a whole, whole thing. And then all the things that came after, because then I had to actually make a book and had to get it out to people uh, in a timeline. And of course, right as everybody was getting all their stuff and was finishing it is when all, all the quarantine stuff happened and borders started closing and I was like, I have people I have to ship to in foreign countries, and I'm not allowed to do this. Well, it's a great excuse to have more time. So yeah. It's not my fault. Got, it's I a quarantine. Uh, yeah, like, it's so funny, because I live, I live in Minnesota in the middle of the United States. Literally, Canada is a two-hour drive from me. And it took my books three months. Wow. To get there because they were they were just stopped at the border and held for I I don't know how long, um, but people are like, is it coming? I'm like, well, it's sent. <laughs> like I don't know where it is. It's literally sitting somewhere in quarantine. I have no idea when you're getting your books. People in England, people in France, people in Japan got theirs long before Canada did, and they are literally two hours away. Well, yeah, it's you know that that's a bit which uh, I probably uh, I'm you know uh, before doing my own uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing a number of people, even doing a, a special panel about doing a Kickstarter. So I got a few people I can reach out to, and probably the 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 sort of support I'm probably the the most keen to pay for is to have someone to to deal with the fulfillment aspect uh, of it beyond beyond the writing or, or, of course because it's it looks very very technically challenging uh, in my work I engage a bit with people who work in logistics and I'm like wow that seems that seems so much to to deal with that must be a a very steep learning curve to to do that uh, on your own um, I mean, so I went through a publish. So I went through Drive Through RPG, who does ship on print on demand. So oh, okay. they were going to print everything, and they shipped everything out. But of course, in that process, they went from a full staff to like a person working. So I would submit everything, and then you'd expect normal fast turnaround times except this time it was oh I don't even know if you're open I don't even know if there's people available to do the work like it was right at the beginning it was the you know middle of March beginning of April and every day it was like we've closed down this entire section of what we do we're not making these anymore I'm like well that doesn't apply to me but I still don't know if anybody is actually working in the print shop to to print and bind books, much less if anybody's working with the mail to ship it out. Like, it was just this huge, stressful black hole because I I had no control over it. Like, mm. in, in, the, in the before times, 
I could have just been like, oh, it will just happen quickly. It's fully staffed, and they have a history. And then it hit, and I'm like, not only do I not know what's happening in my own life because I have to work from home now and everything's different, I don't even know if they're considered essential, non essential, if they're staying open, if they're closing, and if they have people to talk to. So, right when. I was supposed to be shipping everything out. It was supposed to be super easy. It was the end. It was like the the most stressful time simply because I had no, I had no insight to what they were doing, um, which is better than me me trying to find a printer and then being like I have five thousand books in my house and I have no idea how to get them to people. Um, but yeah, it was. Oof. <laughs> that was definitely a thing. Were your your followers, uh, I mean, air quote, cool with that? Because I, I know it can be, uh, from from the consumer side of things, uh, well, things can be f become frustrated and sometimes heated oh, yeah. quite quite fast. So depending on how you you manage things and how people react, uh, I imagine can be a a big source source of anxiety as well. Uh, everybody was great. I will say this: all of my backers. None of them were super upset. The good thing is, is that everybody got a copy of the PDF. So they could see the final thing. Like, they all got the PDF right on time, or actually it was a couple of weeks late. But they all had it, and then I think everybody understood, like, we are hitting something that we've never, that's never happened before. Everybody's lives were disrupted. Um, so... I didn't ha like I didn't have the Kickstarter thing of people screaming at me. <laughs> like it, yeah. luckily that never happened. Um a bunch of stuff went missing. Like there are still people who were like it just never showed up. Um for whatever reasons. And you know, I've since dealt with all those and taken care of them and I feel bad that it took, you know, even longer. Uh but that was also the sort of flip side of things is that people knew everything was so behind that they waited a very long time to let me know that they didn't get their book um, it was like oh my record shows that you got that back in April and it's June but they're like yeah I just didn't know if it was hidden somewhere I'm like no <laughs> well I'll get you another one <laughs> thank you you can reach out and say the tracking said that it got here in April I never got it um, you could have sent me that a lot earlier um, and certain people like the toughest part was just talking to people in Canada because I had no no information. I couldn't tell them anything. Uh, I could just say, we have to wait um, three months because that's how long things are taking to get to Canada right now. And so that's a, that was just like a very stressful, hard conversation to have. It's like, this is so, like, I know it's been printed. I know it's been shipped. I have no idea where it is. All I'm being told across the board is it's taking months to get there. Um, and the downside was to reship again restarted the process. It's like, I'll send it again, but then it's going to be another two months to see if it arrives. Yeah. Time. Um, and a few people like who had reached out to me, like we, we'd missed the window. It should have been here. I resent one and they're like, that was quick. I'm like, oops. That was Oops. the first one. <laughs> You'll be getting another one in a month or so. <laughs> well, yeah. Do you have a gift for for a friend a in gift. that give case? It, give it to whoever you wish. But you're done now with with that project. I am done. Well, I guess it's uh, well. I'm not, I mean, you're never done. Yeah. Um. So, like, since then, other people have come to me to help do things with the game. Who want to? translate it or get it into stores so like i it i for being a side hobby because it's definitely not my day job i also wasn't prepared for people to like talk about you know what do you want your business to be and i'm like well this isn't really a business like i'm not making a company <laughs> i just wrote this game i might write more but like i can't I have a job. <laughs> I have an eight to five job that I go to Monday to Friday. It's a bit like uh, 
I like your work, kid. I'm gonna make you a star. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's a little bit of that, um, and then it's getting into the side of, is this a fair contract? I've never done this before. I don't know if this is a good deal, a bad deal. I don't know if these percentages are good. So like, I had to have, especially when the Ennies came out and a lot of people started coming who were like, we, this would really be great. Like, I don't know if this is a good offer. I don't know if this is a bad offer. I don't know if this is fair. I don't know what a standard contract is. So I had to do a, a crash course of learning like what's contracts, what are royalties, what's fair percentages. Um, and I wasn't sort of prepared. I never thought, I didn't think that far down the line. I was just like, I'm going to make a game. I'm going to Kickstarter. It's going to go out, and then it's done. And I didn't sort of think beyond, is there more to do? And what if it's what if it's really successful? Like, the whole thing, like, is it going to be successful? And are a lot of people going to want it? Never really entered my brain for, like, I was so focused on just getting it done and getting out, getting it out the door that I never thought past that point. That was one of the interesting answers I got on the the panel I did about uh, recommend people go check it out. It's called British Recipes for Successful Kickstarters, and, and one of m yeah, what, what I said at one point was that well, I guess there are Kickstarters people who want to to create a, a project of their own. That's what they find. They want to finance. They got people who want to distribute it more widely. And then there are people who are business minded and want to, to have a wider distribution. And the answer from Josh Fox from Black Armada about that was that actually when you start, you don't know which of these people you are because the project's going to tell you depending on how successful it is, which of them you are. So maybe you, you go in thinking oh yeah I'm going to be this big business and you end up air quote just financing your own project which is already a big achievement or the other way around like it seems to be the case with you 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 go there with just the desire to to do a little project and then it, it blows into substantial proportions yeah I never sort of expected to be here like I think I had hoped that it would be very successful and that a lot of people would really like it because that was like just a check mark of things that I wanted to do in my life. Like I want people to play a, a game that I wrote maybe. Um, and then that happened. <laughs> then a lot of people liked it. And I was just not, I never thought beyond that. I never sort of had the thought of people coming and saying, Hey, do you want, are you making a business? Is this something you want to do? Or people asking, what's your next project? When's that time frame? What's that look like? I'm like, I don't know. I've not, I've not thought that far ahead. So there's no Glitch Hearts 2 Electric Boogaloo already uh, in the works? I mean, it's not in the works. <laughs> I never say never. I don't know. There's things I always want to change. Um, I'll go back and rewrite a bunch of stuff. Um, but I'm pretty happy with it as it is right now. So... Uh, I'm leaving it alone, and we'll see how we'll see how it goes. We got Neon Caster in the the stream chat, who was uh, advising me on to boost your your sound. I hope it, it worked. Uh, by the way, I've noticed a new thing: my mouse cursor appears. Didn't appear in the past. Anyway, but he had, or he, she, or them had a question, which is. Uh, what went into the design process of the identity slash archetype slash element design for a character? So for people unaware, your game is a part by the Apocalypse Games, but unlike most yep. of them, you don't pick a booklet, which is the uh, uh, Nefarious Witch at the corner of the street or the Proud Warrior uh, booklet. You assemble three elements together to make your sort of booklet uh, char slash character. So yeah, where where did that come from? Um, so I knew that I wanted to do Powered by the Apocalypse because at the time we had just played we had played a bunch on the podcast, and I really liked how how kind of on the surface easy it was to 
come up with concepts. Like it was pretty well laid out. Um, but then I quickly sort of realized that the so the genre that I was making for, like the magical heroes on a Sailor Moon or Power Rangers, like if I wrote playbooks, they would all be the same playbook. Like all of Sailor Moon are technically they're all warriors. They all fight. They all do things in pretty much the same way. And same with Power Rangers. They pretty much all fight the same way. So very early on, I realized that I wanted the game to be able to reflect that everybody at the party could pick the same type of magical hero. So if everybody wanted to be the warrior, there still needed to be a way for everybody to feel unique in that character that they made. And I felt locking into playbooks was way too restricting for how I felt the game should work. Um, because with a playbook it's like here it is and here's the only things you can do and it's a very strong archetype and that really just didn't work for how I thought this type of game should work and how uh, you like you should be able to build a team um, so once I started to hit on that and realized that I was going to split them apart then I had to look at well what are the basic elements of a hero in these in all of these types of genres and it was there's had needed to be a very clean cut between who they are in real life and then who they are when they're transformed so i knew that there had to be their their school side their normal side and then there had to be their magical side um and then in thinking about that it became very clear to me that I wanted the game to be able to have bo have you play as both sides because I think a lot of like superhero games and a lot of uh, these types of games really everybody's just waiting for the moment that they transform because they don't have anything to do in their regular lives. Um, so it became important to me to write. Everybody has an a, a, an identity that they live day to day, and that identity gives you things that you can do that there are moves specific to who you are as you move through your everyday life um, to help make that important so that when you're not transformed, you still feel like I have all these moves available to me that I can use in both worlds. Um, so then once I had that and then I knew that I needed like an archetype, then I knew I also had to divide out um, what they were tied to, what element they represented. So if everybody wanted to play a warrior, there would still be a unique feeling because a warrior who who deals in fire is going to be different than a warrior who deals with love. Like, I wanted those to feel very separate. So ultimately, to keep it sort of clean, I broke it down into who you are, uh, what you represent, and, and what you're connected to. And made that and then started writing all the then I realized now I have to write unique moves for everything <laughs> like playbooks are you just make this thing and this is how they are and this is how they work um, one of the things that I did was like I've made 150 moves and I have no way of testing how game breaking all of these are like I don't know what the ultimate combination people can make but I, I i tried to keep them all feeling very equal like i spent a lot of time just going through all the moves and saying how does this feel against each other does anything really 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 stand out um and that was a lot of my play testing was just giving it to people letting them make characters and play them and see okay everybody always picks this because there seems to be a clear advantage there uh, and then tweaking it from there. But yeah, sort of not doing the playbook style meant I had a lot longer of <laughs> a writing process trying to write things that felt balanced amongst all of them. Um, and that felt unique, like that every each identity, each archetype, and each elemental connection felt like it was its own thing. 
Um, I think there's a couple areas that I that, that there's a little bit of overlap because it just it fit well and why not? Um, but I really tried to like in the design process give everything to have its own unique feel so that when you look at it and say, oh, that is a warrior thing or that is a witch thing, and that had us that there is a strong connection there so that people could like zero in on a concept pretty easy. It's I thought it was fascinating. Well, it's still fascinating because I'm still doing it. Uh, during the play tests, how you you write your game, you write your rules, but there there are a lot of things which are not exactly in the rules or in the playbooks or whatever you do, uh, which still influence players so much, like the way you in introduce information to them, the visuals you show. Uh, the maybe the prompts, the scripts when you read, or the way the info, again the information is presented. Uh, did you have surprises there where you you needed to tweak things, or maybe change the order of the moves you can pick uh, as part of of this or that, so that you you encourage people to to diversify their game rather than pick each time that that same move uh, as a warrior. Um, yeah. So one of the things that like. When I had first started that, you know, everyday identity thing, who you were in your because that runs your stats. So I had very, I had very strong archetypes, but not a lot of them. So they were, there were like a couple of choices this way, and there were a couple of choices that way. They're like one or two in each one, because writing was a lot. And I'm like, how do I, I have no idea how to make everything feel unique but in play testing because it controls your stats people were like well I really want to make a physical character but who has their their downside is you know their persona stat or their downside is the mystical stat and I can't do that in with the rules as written so it became clear that to sort of compensate for that because that was a fairly common thing like I can mostly make the character that I want but not really um, then I realized, okay, I have to, I literally have to have four for each to cover all of the stat breakouts and then also have a way to make each one of those archetypes feel unique amongst themselves without it just feeling like, oh, this is just like, this is just another athlete, but the stat has moved in a different spot um and so then there was that and then i originally only had four archetypes but then a lot of people were like you know none of the archetypes really use the mental stat and mental stat seems really weak um until you advance far so then i had to write i wrote the tactician which is the last one that i wrote to fill in that gap um and then uh I always knew I sort of wanted like emotional connections, but that was really hard to write. Like I didn't have a good idea. So it was a stretch goal. And then when we hit that stretch goal, I'm like, oh, I guess I'm writing that then. Oops. I guess I have to write nine more things uh, with moves in each of them. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think playtesting sort of showed that people really got the concept easy like they understood that it was a good touchstone but um, I learned early on that when I started writing when I wrote it to have so much flexibility that you could build the character the way you wanted that that also meant that I had to try to go as far as I could um, like I could limit the options under each one of them because once you say you can make all the character make the character you want the way you want if there's a hole there then people there's the feedback is well i can't make the character that i want because mm. this isn't in the rules um and so unlike like i like playbooks like here are the five playbooks and you get to choose one of these and that's super strong to this setting and most people are like you know great i can find something in there and it's set in stone um I hadn't sort of thought through the process of if I let you customize, you're really going to want to customize, which means I really have to do a lot of writing. Um, and I did, and I'm very, very happy with how it turned out. Um, but yeah, I sort of hadn't thought that through 
all the way down until I was in play testing and getting feedback. Well, I believe I assume you you discuss glitter arts to to death on on, on many shows, and uh, <laughs> we are we are halfway. And uh, I know you want to talk about very random encounters. So yeah, tell me about it. When did it start? Is it did it start before the glitter arts project, or oh, yes. as a result of that? Um. So it all started really. Um, so I ran a D and D campaign. It is so it was Pokemon set in the D and D world or D and D set in the Pokemon world, depends on what you want. It was called Mythical, um, and I had I was the DM for that. I think in 2016 is when that started, um, and uh, Logan and Wheels and I were part of that project. Um, the thing about Mythical was we would record an entire season at once. So it was like a three day process and uh, we all would sit together and I'd run through the campaign for that season, you know, all the Pokemon stuff and all the D and D stuff. And then it would just, we wouldn't touch it again for seven months or eight months because, you know, we had recorded everything for that season and it was just the process of getting that out and then we would all wait and we enjoyed that experience so much that I said I really want to do more I really want to record more I want to play more with you all we have a, we have a great time doing this project let's do something else on our own in the downtime um, and so then we had talked about well what do we want to do like what 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 is fun because we're already doing a D&D &D thing um, let you know and let's do some sort of actual play thing and you know I'm the oldest person in the group because uh, I grew up uh, during the start of RPGs back in the 80s um, and I said well as long as we don't do that thing that we used to do way back in the day which is you just rolled up random characters <laughs> and then we're like and I think it was Logan that said, or what if we really, really leaned into that random concept and we randomized not only our characters, but everything else. Um, and that concept was really scary. Like, okay, but how would that even work? What, what does it even look like? And since none of us knew what that looked like, that's when we said, well, let's let's try it and see. Let's see how this looks. Um, and so our first season was D&D &D because of every game system out there, D&D &D has a million websites and a million supplements and a million ways. And so many people had done the work already. Um, and so it was Wheels, Logan, and I. And then we're like, well, we need another person. And the person that we had in mind couldn't do it. And Logan's like, well, I have a really good friend, Lee, uh, but she's never really played a lot of RPGs. Like, this would be one of the first things. And we're like, well, if she's willing to do it and go with it, because this is a crazy idea and we don't know if this is going to work. Um, if she's willing to do it, let's do it. Um, and I sort of feel a little bad for Lee because it was we literally threw her into the deep end of... RPGs, because not only do you have no control over who you're going to play, you literally learn uh, uh, every first episode of every season is all of us learning who our characters are. What's our name? <laughs> what are we? Who are we? Um, and so that's like free fall improv of here you are. You've just got a character. Now, now we're going to play a game. Um, and so we did D and D, uh, and the first <laughs> I always say the first season D and D is absolutely wild. Like we did everything. There were secret words, and the entire map was randomized. And there was a lot of things that we learned in that first season. Like if you have all of these extra surprise elements, they're incredibly difficult to stay on top of 
when you're also trying to play a game. Um, so a lot of like D and D is like the that season is wild. It's just we threw everything at the wall, and then from then on we sort of went. These are the things that really work, and this is how this really works. Um, briefly, we had toyed with we would roll to see who would GM the next season, so that was always going to be random. Well. <laughs> But that proved to be so difficult to be able to plan. Uh, and since once you left D&D, there aren't a lot of websites for like Uncharted Worlds or Call of Cthulhu or um, Tales from the Loop that let you randomize their systems. They just That just doesn't exist. Um, so it became pretty clear that whoever was going to GM needed time to prepare because you needed to make all the tables and come up with a way to randomize, especially since the GM doesn't know the plot line of the game they're going to run. Um, when we pick a system, whoever's going to GM randomly determines what the plot line is, um, who the villains are. Uh, we randomize it on all sides. So um, it's one of the things I love about our show is the first episode is our character creation episode. So we do the characters and they see who they are and then we play the game. And then the final thing we do is the after show where the GM gets to say, here's all the things that I rolled. Here's all the elements that I got. And this is what I had to work with. And this is the plot line that we got so that we can talk about. So they see it at the beginning and then they see what the GM had to do at the end to sort of encapsulate um, the whole gambit of what happened in that season. Um, and it it was so much fun the first time, and we've been doing it ever since. I think it's now three years that we've been at this, or close to three years. Um, you know, we always say you know, every season is self-contained. So if you look at our show, you can probably find a game that you're interested in. So what games did you like. play? So, so far, we, we've done Dungeons & Dragons. We did uh, Marvel Super Heroes, the old TSR. Nice. One of my all-time favorite systems ever of all time. Uh, Call of Cthulhu, Uncharted Worlds, uh, Root, Tales from the Loop, um, Star Wars... I know I'm missing something. And then we do mini seasons, so we have guests on for mini seasons. So in there, we've done things like Monster of the Week. Uh, we've done. Um, we did. We just did Troika. We we've done. We did Glitter Hearts as a as a as a one off for me to test my game, and also to have something to put on the Kickstarter because <laughs> like I don't, can't make a video on my own, so I'll run this. Uh, we've done Dinosaur Princesses. We did Fellowship as a full season. Mothership as a mini season. Um, uh, we but had a whole... Logan wrote a whole anime thing. So we had an anime season out of the D6 system. So uh, we've just done a whole bunch of things. Dude, that's a lot. That's excellent. Yeah. So, and generally, so it's funny because we always talk about, oh, our, some, you know, like, I just did Star Wars. I just, we just concluded our Star Wars season, and it's the longest season we've done. And our longest season is 21 episodes. You know, you look at other things that's like, this campaign has been going on for four years, and there's 500 episodes to get through. Um, our longest season right now, which is Star Wars, uh, is 21 episodes uh, of anywhere between half an hour to an hour. Um, we sit down and record. We record for an hour and a little longer, and then whatever we get out of that is the episode. So our times can fluctuate, but it's generally between half an hour to an hour. Um, but yeah, like we wanted to make sure that people could jump in. We also really wanted to say there are so many games out there that aren't D&D. Um, and people never get to hear them. People never see them. People don't know about them. Um, and we really wanted to explore all 
RPGs. Like, what kind of stories did we want to tell? Um, and what system matches up with that? And so we sort of early on said we were going to do D&D the first season, and that's probably the last time we're ever going to hit it because there are so many RPGs, um, and all of them are so fun. Uh, that we really just want to explore them all and see what happens when you try to randomize those. It's an old theme of, of my show to lament that uh, D&D is so important and uh, there's a debate whether or not it helps or not the hobby. At this stage, I'm, I'm a bit frustrated that D&D fans are, uh, don't show more curiosity for the the wider hobby because, as you said, there, there's so many stuff and they're so different from D&D. they the the better or worst I mean they they are appropriate for different things and they, they, there are a lot of assumptions which are made based on that uh, sort of uh, I don't know what's the word you know uh, a lot of people say oh your first uh, tabletop role playing game oh it should be D and I'm like no <laughs> no because you're gonna be full of those presumptions uh, because D and D is heavy for good and bad reasons. And once you played it, you, you start assuming that everything else is like that, that you need a, a player's handbook to play it, that you're creating your character and mastering, not, not as game mastering, but achieving a, a level of system mastery going to require you to, to take so much time. And it's also, uh, it's funny, I, I realized, because we, we've been in touch for a while to record this, and I I've sort of forgot how I added you on my Twitter and so on. Uh, I added you because I'm I'm a listener, occasional listener of of Pokemon Cast, mm, uh, yes. which I recommend other, people. Uh, pick, yeah. <laughs> the other thing that I do. So yeah, I listen to quite a bit of them, and I played Pokemon Co quite a bit, and and uh, you know when I I see even my wife playing Dungeons and Dragons, and t and other people telling me stuff like, oh, we could play this game tonight, and they're part of a a club which has got a permanent world, so your character is like a, a massively online role-playing game, sort of. And I got people telling me, oh yeah, I'd really like to play this game, but I want to play tonight because I really want to reach that level 7 uh, with my rogue uh, to, to play uh, that character. And I, and I really feel like this is bad. This is this is this is the sort of things. You know, that's the, the aspect I don't like about something like Pokemon. It's this grinding and almost monetized aspect of you keep people in your ecosystem because you tell them no 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 no. Just shop more some some more wood, uh, collect a few eggs or kill those goblins, and then you're gonna be level seven and and people stick around because of that rather than play Tales from the Loop, Vampire or absolutely any other game which is uh, which is available. I can't blame them. No! I like, D&D like, <laughs> is incredibly successful for a very good reason. Um, at its heart, whether you think it's too crunchy or not, it was the first one to do it, really. Um, and it does it does something that sits in a lot of people's cultural touchstones very easy. Um, they've heard of it. Um, D and D has 40 years of history behind it. Um, and it set, it sort of set the world. Um, and they have a lot of money and they have a lot of famous people who are making money off of, off of their IP. Like I, I can't, I can't hold it accountable for, for its own success. Um, well, that's a, an interesting I, thing I, because sometimes I'm wondering, is it accountable? Is it <laughs> deserving of its own success? Because but, uh, especially right now, it benefits from the yeah. support, the pro bono support of so many, so many people. And it's, it's a policy now in that company. So that's, yeah. that's a bit weird. But the thing is, is that it's also a corporation, right? Um, and I think a lot of people forget that for as much as D&D &D promotes that it's about community and it's about its players and it's about coming together, Wizards and Hasbro 
is a very large corporation and will be making very large corporate decisions based off of what a corporation is. It's almost the only corporation in the tabletop RPG yeah. sphere. There's, well, I think there's Fantasy Flight, which I guess is part of Asmodee, so it's a corporation. But beyond yeah, that, there's the only they one. Just, you know, they just fired all their RPG people and sent them to a freelance group. So even, even, even Fantasy Flight isn't the corporation that Wizards is. Um... And, you know, I work for an incredibly large telecom corporation in my day job. Like, I I understand fundamentally how bad corporations are because I work in one. Um, and I think a lot of what the heartburn is, um, especially in current things, is they are the only super corporation out there. And almost every other RPG creator is a small business. And in its inherent nature, small businesses can be more risky and can turn on a dime faster. Um, large corporations can make fast decisions, but if they're going to make a fast decision, it's going to be a super safe decision because the nature of being a large corporation means you are, you are sued on a continual basis. Um, you can do nothing without legal consulting. You can't make decisions. You can't, you can't point to other people's work without expecting that to result in a lawsuit. Um, and I think a lot of the heartburn that happens around, in particular with Dungeons and Dragons, is people believe that I play this with all my friends and I and these designers are very friendly and this is a friendship based thing and it's absolutely not. It is a giant, giant business that is very much into keeping you within its ecosystem, telling you giving you all the support you need for the ecosystem, and then also drawing in content creators to give them free advertising um and i've i've been a part of that i've given them free advertising i've gotten things out of that uh too that have benefited me um you know i can't say that it's not been a uh every time that we've done things for them and hasn't been you know all one-sided um but it is very much a they want to keep you in their world because that's where they make a lot of money and they have profits and they have things that they have to answer for. And because they're a huge business, they have to show growth. They have to show all these things that come with being a large business and, you know, having to report to a board of directors. Like, why didn't you make as much money this year as you did last year? What are you doing to fix that? Um, and I think people are wanting them to not be a giant corporation and that's never going to happen they're never going to be the company that you want them to be um and that was one of the things that we also sort of hit on with very random encounters like we want to give everybody a shot of systems we want like if somebody's promoting their system and people are like i don't know how to play this or I've never heard it or I've never seen it, hopefully they can point to us and say here's a group of people that played our game in the most wild way possible <laughs> like they've randomized everything and they're just they're just in our rules doing whatever they want but like we've had a lot of people who are like I have, I've always wanted to hear this game played and I'm so happy somebody did it um, with us we understood that we are it's incredibly hard to attract an audience if you're not playing the big game. Yep. People aren't searching Tales from the Loop actual play. They aren't. Um, that was one, also one of the reasons that we said we'll start with D&D because it makes us easier to find. But despite Tales from um, the Loop being a rather successful yeah. game in the, in the industry, still it doesn't compare. Yeah, well, people are like, oh, you mean the TV show? It's like, well... It was <laughs> It was an art book 
and a game before it was the TV show. And still people don't know, like, there's just not those ties back. They don't think about it. Like, even Star Wars is a hard thing for people to think, oh, they're like, oh, there's a Star Wars RPG? Well, of course there is. Um, it just doesn't have money. And, like, Fantasy Flight Games isn't a small company, nor is Asmodee, but they they are not Hasbro by any means. Um, and so it's just hard for people to see outside of that ecosystem. It's I mean, funny. At the same time, it's funny because in my interaction, I benefited from uh, interactions from Wizards, but what I found out, which I thought was really fascinating, as you say, the, the people, Wizards of the Coast, need to engage with boards of directors at Hasbro, and they tell them, oh, you, how much money you made, and so on. And despite D&D being D&D in the world of tabletop role-playing games, when you show up at Hasbro, and you're like, we are Dungeons and & Dragons, and we made that much money, and they're like, what? That little? That's right. That's peanuts compared to anything else that Hasbro does. And it's quite fascinating. It's almost a feature of a hobby that it's it's not a money-making ma- machine, at least until further notice. And that means that despite Wizards making so much money, when they go show to the board and say, well, we made that much money, and the board say, that's not enough, and you don't have money to go. They don't have money, like... Even, even Fantasy Flights is like that, but... Uh, here in the UK, we have UK Games Expo. It's like the third biggest gaming convention. It's on par with Origins. And and Wizards don't show up. Uh, they send two guys without a booth. And they're not even full-time uh, Dungeons & Dragons. They mainly deal with Magic the Gathering. And But it, it's fascinating because they, all those people... the, the uh, What's their name? You know, the Perkins and, and so on. Mm-hmm. They... They don't have the means that even someone like at Chaosium or Modifius have because most of their money go- just go away. <laughs> it goes away into Hasbro, and Hasbro is unwilling to to spend the money that people that smaller businesses are keen to spend to be seen at conventions yep. and so on because they're like, yeah, we yep. why would we go to Expo? We don't care about that. Why would we go in Luca? Why would we go in Spiel in Germany? We have absolutely no interest in doing that. While someone like Paizo, they go there. They don't even sell games there. They just have this big booth. They they present their games to people, and they believe other dealers to sell Pathfinder to them. But uh, yeah, Wizards doesn't do that because Hasbro won't let them spend that money. <laughs> no, um, like when Wizards pulled out of Gen Con the convention that was literally started because of Dungeons and Dragons. That's when I sort of knew, okay, there they are. They are absolutely just a company at this point. Like they are fully absorbed into the corporation. Um, And I have friends that work there. Like Jeremy Crawford and I have known each other for 15, 16 years now. It's not a judgment um, of individuals working there or, yeah. or, or even fans of Dungeons & Dragons. I mean, you know, the the reason I, I complain a bit about Dungeons & Dragons is I got nothing against the game. I got nothing about someone who plays it. It's a bit like, you know, yesterday I was in a park, I uh, had a banana peel, and I couldn't find a bin. So I threw the peel, the banana peel in a bush. And you know what? It's a banana peel. It's going to dissolve. I think it's... it's, Mm -hmm. I'm pretty much certain that it's safe. Uh, There's nothing wrong with that. But if we were a thousand people or even a hundred showing up in that alley and throwing banana peels at that bush, we would kill that bush. The the problem is sort of the the number and the the gravity it creates, you know, the critical mass of individuals doing the same thing that sort of creates a, a situation which is not something they intended, but that's that's a reality you have to, to deal with. Yeah. I mean, like, there's certain things that super frustrate me about the D&D actual play ecosystem. Like, Critical Role is incredibly popular. Their episodes are four hours long. And that blocks out anybody else from entering into those fans lives it's very tough because... i tried i was very motivated to get in because uh, 
yeah. recorded episodes with fans at conventions. Uh, I went to panels featuring the cast of Critical Role. I was all, wow, oh, that's really cool. I want to get in. And it's such, whew, it's such a steep climb. <laughs> It's, it's not four hours a week. I don't ha- like. I don't give TV shows four hours a week. Um, it's so much, and it's good. I, you know, the stuff that I've seen, I've really, really liked. Like they are very good at what they do, but it doesn't allow their audience to go elsewhere. Because if you take a detour out if you don't keep up on it you fall behind so fast um and i think that's one of the things that sort of frustrates me with a lot of a lot of podcasting content is it's not a lot of it's not made with the listener in mind like this is a three-hour episode it's like okay well then that if i can only listen to and from work I'm hitting that in 20 minute bursts so that's going to take me 3 or 4 days to get through and then you have another 3 hour episode 3 days after Um, I I find that economy very frustrating in the actual play world and it really limits people from finding and doing other things because especially in things like Dungeons and Dragons where they're telling a story if you miss 3 hours you don't know where they are if you jump back in there's no entrance ramp but the beginning. Um, and that was a huge part of us deciding how we wanted to do very random encounters. You have multiple entrance ramps and the seasons are short. We're only asking at most 21 weeks of 45 minutes of your time. And in that time, I, I will say this. In our short amount of time, we do as much work and tell as much story as people who do over five years because we know we don't have the time. We know we we are not going to drag this out and get to the payoff four years down the line. We are going to get to it 19 to 20 episodes, and so we need to get there fast. Um, and, and one of the big things is we really want to make sure that you can listen to us on a Monday and have the rest of your week open to explore all the other things that you have. We will always be there on Monday with about an hour of your time. Uh, we'll tell a great story and then you are free to live your life and explore other things. We are not going to monopolize all of your stuff. Like that level of, I mean, we talk about this a lot, making sure that we respect our listeners time so that they don't feel trapped by us. And I feel I feel that a lot with like a lot of the longer running um shows. Like I I've, I've fallen behind cuz I'm just not listening to podcasts because I don't have a commute anymore. I've fallen behind on a million things and when I look at my phone I'm like I have hundreds of hours of podcasts from friends of mine that I'm just never going to get to. And it's a I bit like, and, and it's, you know, I had that recently with a with a TV show. Part of the fun is the engagement you have with the community, or at least witnessing yeah. what's going on in the community while you're sharing it. So I, I saw a show, The All House, that people started posting fan arts and so on on Twitter, and I was like, oh, seems nice, seems like something I, I dig. So oh, it's Disney. I got Disney Plus. Gonna go check on Disney Plus. Oh, Disney Plus, The All House. It's not available. Oh, why? Is it because I'm the UK? No. Oh, it's because it's on Disney Channel. So they're waiting for the whole season to be over on Disney Channel before to putting it in on Disney Plus. Well, uh, <laughs> I'm watching the whole house, and it's I just have an option. I need to unclick the Russian dubbing before being able to listen to it. Good play, Disney. I remove my subscription to Disney Plus because I, I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> I want to have time yeah. to to binge a full season of Disney Plus. Why people stop talking about it? Uh, what I find also yeah. f- fascinating with Critical Role, and it's it's not a criticism. It's it's something I find sincerely fascinating. You know, you got stuff you you study or you share 
you know, there's a legacy among nerds. Like, oh, have you mm -hmm. seen Labyrinth? Or have you seen Ghostbusters? Have you seen even, I don't know, the the first season of, of that show uh, from uh, for back in the days? I don't know, like The Avengers, the old British show. And people could go yeah. there and check it out and even talk about it. Uh, I mean, as part of a, a study in film studies or something like that. And And then now you've got shows like CW they, they are 22 episodes they got 10 mm -hmm. seasons like Supernatural I'd love to get into Supernatural but it's like I cannot do that <laughs> and you got Critical yeah. Role and you're like what is it gonna be like Critical Role I mean it's part of the charm I guess it's it's like yeah. it's it's in the now but yeah it, I don't see anyone in 20 years saying well today we're gonna talk about Campaign 2 of Critical Role because that would mean they go out there and they listen to, I don't know, 300, 400 hours of yeah. content. It's a really weird yeah. format that no one will be ever able to consume. And notwithstanding the fact that whoever will be there in 25 years will look back at 2020 and say, so what was in vogue in 2020? Like, what was in vogue in the 60s? Well, there was those few 5, 10 movies. Uh, they were probably yeah. more, but they've forgotten. Then there was that year's album of the Beatles. And, and but if you're in 2050, 2045, and you look at 2020, so what was going on in 2020? And you got this wall of yeah. content, even just on TV, that it's completely impossible for you to consume and then to try to digest and articulate and make a of TV film theory about. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I have friends who have, sometimes people are like, I'm thinking of getting into Critical Role. I'm like, well, it was nice knowing you. <laughs> I will never see you again. You have a lot, you have a lot of content to get through and that's going to eat, it's not, it's not your life. It's not your job. Like, part, okay, I, my work day is eight hours. <laughs> so <laughs> literally critical roles, a part-time job <laughs> it's four hours that I need to get there. It's not going to happen. Um, and you know, I've met a bunch of the people. They're very lovely people. I, I think they are doing great things. They are very successful. Um, I just, I think much, you know, they have become a company like, everything does that gets super successful you have to become a thing um to be able to manage that thing and that thing that they always become is a company and all of the good and bad that goes with it um you know critical role as much as they are at their heart a group of friends that started playing D D together they aren't that thing anymore they are now a company. They have people that work for them. They have people that rely on them. Um, and yeah, that's the I thing. And they might be missing being a f group of friends. I mean, it's nice to be able yeah. to live out of something, but they they cannot they cannot go in a game of D and D and you know I I do obnoxious things as part of role playing games. You know, in game. <laughs> If I was yeah. a business, and not only I was a business and it was my, the way I, I earned my living, but other people earn their living, I cannot go in a, a game of, uh, I don't know, fiasco and uh, play a, a guy who was responsible for Challenger exploding because he organized one of the astronauts to burn their bra. You know, I cannot do right. that <laughs> because right. uh, Twitter is going to be on fire. I can do it now because no one cares what I do or what, right. not too much what I say but uh, I cannot cancel myself by or <laughs> even just you know just hurt people not even the consequences right. of what I do or what I say uh, but uh, yeah impacting somebody else and hurting them it's, uh, when I'm goofing around in a role playing game and doing things which might be inappropriate uh, I do it with the knowledge that I'm not hurting anyone they are, I mean they are safety tools and if I'm right. hurting one of the players Hopefully, I will know right away, and I will apologize and try to to make amend for it. But uh, yeah, I don't have three thousand people who might be triggered by something I, I would say or, or do. Yeah, and I think they are feeling that now, right? Like there has been a number of things where people are like, 
this isn't good. Like they are, they are no longer. They are, they are no longer making it just for themselves. They are now making it for consumption. And when you switch from making it for yourself to making it for consumption, role playing games become a very different thing. When you know we are doing this for pe- other people to enjoy. Um, and there are a lot of just things you can't do anymore. Like, this isn't my home game. <laughs> this isn't us in a group of friends who have a common understanding of who we are, how we interact, what we mean, um, our shared history. This is now a bunch, uh, uh, you know, how many are in Critical like nine strangers effectively who are interacting with millions of people and you're making something for their consumption and I think that gets hard because you are not you, they aren't scripted they can't go through and say hey this let's have people read this and, and pick up pain points it's we are doing this in real time and our stumbles and our failures are going to be seen by a lot of people and immediately spread around and i think they are feeling that quite heavily right now it's not a it's not a comfortable feeling um it's but, part of the appeal also to right. what you consume that it's you, you need to maintain at least an illusion of you you are just watching a group of friends playing together as soon as as that is being lost well people will tune to something else and well I will go watch Stranger Things instead if it, if it's if it feels scripted controlled yeah. uh, th- that's a paradox of it that's the beauty mm-hmm. of it but that's that's a big paradox of it it's a it's a tight rope to walk that's for dang sure yeah, I, you know, tying back to Pokemon cards, I was thinking that <laughs> it's a bit. You know, we were talking about consuming the whole go of Critical Role or, or Supernatural. Uh, Pokemon was a bit like that when I started Pokemon Go. I, I just missed. You know, I was just too old. Well, not too old, like I couldn't, but just missed the the big wave of the original Pokemon. But it's like, oh yeah, this game I need to. I can capture 252. I believe that's the number. Pokemon, that sounds fun, and then you start playing, and you're like, yeah, you know, I'm going slow on it. Uh, maybe uh, I will get 200, and it will be nice. And at some point, you reach the point where, well, there's 3,000 Pokemons now, and you're like, <laughs> that's not worth there it. There are not. There are not 3,000. There are 900. 900. There that's are eight it. Generations. There's only 900. They are. They are. They are very much slowing the roll to get to a thousand. But is it in uh, Pokemon they, Go or in all the Pokemons? In yeah. all Pokemon, but they're all coming to Pokemon Go. Yeah, like, but sort of slowly but surely. But, yeah, uh, so, that's sort of the weird thing about Pokemon Go is those of us who know what's coming is watching them, how how Go decides to roll things out. Because um, in, in the core games, we're in Generation 8. Uh, Generation 9 is probably coming in, in two years, which will introduce a whole bunch of other... Pokemon. But what's interesting is watching how Go is trying to compensate and slowly roll out all these generations, because we are now in Pokemon Go up to Generation 4, but they still haven't released all of Generation 4. And it's fascinating to watch and try to fathom (laughs) how they decide what to release when. Like There are just some plain old Pokemon from Gen 4 that just aren't in the game for unknown reasons. Like, (laughs) why? Why aren't they in this game? They're not even that good. They just are Pokemon to collect. Um, Like, Kecleon from Gen 3 still isn't in the game for unknown reasons. Like, it's, it's in the code. They've just never released it. Um... It's fascinating. It's also fascinating. Like, I came in, so I am not your typical Pokemon player because the games came out here in 98, and I was fully an adult when the games came out. I was 28 years old when they came out. So I've had a very different 
road with these games than most people because so do you mean you went to school with a game boy and started talking to kids yeah. like hey kids hey kids what you got I'm, I'm about i'm about to get arrested <laughs> um so you know for me pokemon was a very solitary thing because i was an adult um and i really really loved the games but like i also had money to buy two cartridges so i could trade amongst myself you know when I was 28, I was already in a long-term relationship, so I had another person to play with. So, it, you know, it was a very encapsulated thing. And I don't have nostalgia for the game, really, um, because it wasn't, like, it wasn't a formative part of my childhood. Like, it wasn't a part of my childhood. It came into, it came into existence <laughs> in the 90s, and I was an adult. Um, you know, like, I have the nostalgia for Star Wars, because that's, you know, 1977, I was in the theater when, like, movie came out um so i have a very different view of it uh because it's just like i've always been an adult interacting with this property um and i've always been aware that they're a company so it's really interesting as i run into people who are who played it as kids who are adults now and sort of seeing them grapple with the nostalgia of this was such a big part of my childhood but i never thought of them as a company and now having to sort of <laughs> run up against oh they need to make money and these things are corporate decisions and you know Niantic makes so much money off of Pokemon Go I think they'd still make like a million dollars a month off that game okay. which is talking of comparison with Dungeons and Dragons I think Pokemon Go is like <laughs> you, you yeah. take the two next to one another. It's like, yeah, yeah. You, you're you're funny, Dungeon and Dragon. You're all cute. Yeah. You oh, do cute not make the money you? that this mobile app does using somebody else's IP. Um, but yeah, I mean, I love Pokemon Go, and I also hate it um, because I I get resentful of things that want me to pay attention to them every day, and that somewhat punish you for not paying attention to them every day. I will say that Pokemon Go punishes you probably the least if you don't check in every day. Like, you just your streak breaks, but the end result of getting a streak isn't that great. Anyways, if you're not playing a lot, the bonuses you get at the end of the week aren't going to make you play more. Um, but yeah, it's like okay, like, Community Day is coming up on Sunday, and we're making plans to go do Community Day as best we can in the middle of a pandemic when you can't be around people. Um, yeah, I was wondering about that. So, so my own Pokemon Go, I had moments when uh, I I played a lot, and like, I would go on walks specifically to play Pokemon Go. Around the time my son was born, uh, to put him to sleep, uh, I would <laughs> walk mm -hmm. him into the cradle around my neighborhood at the same time catch Pokemon in the area and it's sort of the yeah I really like Pokemon Cast for that because it allowed me to have a feel of what more dedicated players might be like also it's funny because I'm here in London I'm walking around so <laughs> I'm having a, a laugh at your ex at the expense of some of you when you describe driving around your American towns <laughs> with mm -hmm. that that many landmarks or even traveling to the next town to get something. Why I, I'm in London. I mean I'm fully loaded in uh, Pokemon gyms and stops uh, as as you could. I also had a lot of fun uh, kicking out of gyms uh, when I, I visit parents in Belgium. They they were. A Pokemon gene in, in a church, and clearly in the area, they didn't have a lot of things going on, so it's very fun to show up there with your big Pokemon and, and uh, <laughs> crap the, yeah. kick the crap out of them. But uh, yeah, I was wondering about that. I was considering uh, re listening to Pokemon Cat because at the moment uh, I'm out of my uh, uh, sort of coming back and off uh, Pokemon Go obsession. How did they manage COVID? Because when that happened, I was like, I'm wondering what's going on with Pokemon Go because, yeah, you should stay at home in lockdown. Right. Oh. So, I, I mean, for the most part, I think Niantic was very clever. Um, they changed a lot of things. Uh, so, pre-COVID, they did the buddy system, right? So you could have, you could walk with your Pokemon buddy. Um, you, you could pair together and then you'd feed 
you know, you'd, you'd pay attention to it and then it would show up on the map walking with you. And that was a pre COVID thing. Um, so when, when the pandemic hit and people couldn't leave, they started changing the game. So your buddy will go out to stops for you and bring gifts back. Wow. So if you're, so if you if you've built up the relationship with your Pokemon buddy, the more things that will go out and grab for you and bring it back. Um, they introduced the remote raid pass system. So you can buy raid passes. And if you can see a gym anywhere on the map, you can go to it and use a raid pass to jump into that gym and do that raid. Um, they've also done an invite system now so that you can invite friends who are on your friends list who are anywhere in the world. Like if you can oh. say, Hey, I'm about to do this raid. If they have a remote raid class, they can jump in with you. So they introduced team rocket balloons. So because team rocket was always tied to a Pokestop. Well, you can't go to stops right now necessarily. And so now Team Rocket Balloons fly around and you can hit them and, and do your rocket battles to take care of them. They've done a lot to um, really help people to stay inside and still get a lot out of the game. You know, Community Day is... It used to be three hours. It's now six hours long. Incense lasts a long time and they... Every 30 seconds, the incense pulls a new Pokemon. So what was there will disappear. And so that you can sit there on a three-hour instance and, and, and get something coming to you without having to move. I think of all of sort of the mobile games that require you to move, they were on, they were on top of it. Um, there's some downsides, like... Remote raid passes are a do are a dollar each, a dollar American convert it. So if you and you can only ever hold three. So if you want to do a bunch of raids with your friends, that money adds up really quickly. Um, you know, you are just spending a lot of money to do something that you could do for free if you could move around in the world. Um, and I think a lot of people are getting a little frustrated with. Um, how how they aren't hiding the money side of it anymore as well. Oh, uh. like all of these things cost money, and you have to buy them to be able to interact with this game during this weird time. And I think people are are beginning to bristle a little against that sort of. They're still a company, but I think they used to be able to hide. They used to be able to hide the cost from you better. Well, that's a, that's the thing with a lot of those games. Uh, I tended to be... I don't know what it's called. I, I know the opposite. It's called a whale. Uh, the, yeah. I, I, was, I was one of the players who managed to play with pretty much not spending anything. I think I... Sp uh, maybe I, I bought some Pokeballs early, like the first year or something like that, but I would never spend anything on there. And I was like... Yeah, and other players who are more passionate, they can they can spend a lot of money in there if they want. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I could imagine that that could be one of the things. If I had continued, that would have got me to to drop off, being like, well, if I need to spend money to play it, play it. But I'd be like, yeah, I guess I guess that's a game, <laughs> but then I'm not passionate. About it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, they've done, you know. It's fascinating how it's an evolving game. That's that's something which yeah. I thought very interesting. Uh, it was an interesting phenomenon the first year it came out. Uh, the game wasn't that great. As a architect, urban designer, it, I thought it was fascinating <laughs> because here in the UK we've got blue plaques, which are blue rondels which you put on historic buildings and places. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time I was thinking how... Uh, I would go to seminars and we would discuss how do we get people to get interested in their environment, in their communities, and actually Pokemon Go managed to, to do that it did. on some level. It was also a summer which was interesting. Some people said that the, the COVID summer was the opposite summer because instead right. of interacting with strangers like we did with Pokemon, uh, yeah, we were cut off for, from everybody. But actually, it was that's why I came back a couple times to to come and see. Okay, what changed now? 
I will hear about an update and will be like, oh, that's actually quite in interesting. It, it, it's very interesting how they, it's a reactive game. It reacts about changes in society and big events like, like what we are noticing r right now. So uh, I'm always curious to see what are the thing is. And that's why I recommend people check Pokemon Cast so they can keep be stay posted about that <laughs> without <laughs> having to play. <laughs> Yeah, you can come to It's Super Effective, the Pokemon podcast, and uh, hear me sing at the every at the end of every episode. Lots of Exciting. good music in between. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that. At someone who put music in my own podcast, and I got people complain about it. What the music got to do with that? Why why do you put it in there? And I also like. I guess it's around the time. I love you were mentioning about which Pokemon are released and so on. Uh, I love the debates and uh, hanger sometimes about which Pokemon is released as part of Halloween. <laughs> so that this one, this was an appropriate. How? <laughs> How do they never release ghosts? It is the most obvious connection, and they never do it. I don't understand. <laughs> they, they're mind boggling. They, they know you, Greg. They're teasing you. They're, they're <laughs> just withholding them. But the thing is, it's like. Halloween's a huge thing in Japan. It's not like they don't know. Well, you got like, Zubats. You just... got you got Halloween Easter. <laughs> they don't even do Zubat. Like <laughs> next next Community Day in October for Halloween is Charmander. What? <laughs> <laughs> like I don't get it. I don't. They, I don't understand. I don't get what why they make these decisions. Um. Yeah, it's it's so funny, like not being in the company and just sort of being on the outside, speculating as to <laughs> why are you making these decisions? Could you just somebody please tell us who made this decision because it makes zero sense. That would be such a cool Netflix documentary, having a documentary about Nine Tick, and like you would have started with the release of the game and. You come back uh, every year and see uh, how the thing evolves. And it's probably messy. It's a pretty big mess. Because oh. <laughs> so... well, I, mean, I played Ingress before Pokemon Go came out. So I was an Ingress player, uh, which, you know, is the structure of that underlays Pokemon Go. So it's funny because when I was playing Ingress, I was high enough level that I could submit stops. Ooh, nice. Um, and so there's a park up by us where um, my old dog, Winter, uh, as I was taking the picture, uh, Winter came under it. So the picture is the park sign and then my dog. Uh, so now permanently in Pokemon Go, everybody who uses that stop is using my picture and my dog uh, in it because I could do it for Ingress. Because, you know, Pokemon Go didn't allow them to submit stops for Ever. It was just based off of the Ingress uh, underlay. It was very fascinating because I'm like, there was a little hack because I was still in Ingress that I could go into Ingress and submit stops there and then have them show up and go sometime later as long as they got approved. There was like those of us who played in, in between, but Ingress was such a different game and they were such a small company to see what they are now <laughs> like go change their world completely and they're still a smallish team but um my, my brother worked for companies like that which uh, uh i don't know if you ever heard of ankama i think it's cool it's you know it's one of those companies you know uh web apps and online games there are games like that which are so profitable. Again, much more profitable than any tabletop role-playing game, including D&D, will ever be. Mm -hmm. But you, you would not have heard of them because they, they they got sort of their niche and they managed to have their subscription and so on. And so this company, they, they even have cartoons now uh, called Wakfu. Uh, they're on Netflix oh, and yeah, so yeah. on. And, I know them. And the, the offices are huge and grand design with glass partition all of that they, they, they got their whole animation in-house and it's sort of like this flow of money coming every month and the manager is like this guy would design a game and i mean he's a nice dude or he's not a nice dude but it's just this kind of yeah what do you do when you achieve this much power and you've got like a team manager is like the 
a friend from high school who technically is, was a butcher and he just mm -hmm. hired him at some point early on and now this guy is in charge of a whole department of things and it's just this thing which grew and, and <laughs> like what, what do we do I don't know throw money at it we still make good business business position but at the same time it's it's become so disproportionate and ridiculous that we don't know what we're doing really uh, we're trying to they're, they're trying to release a, a sequel to the game which is as successful and it's impossible because it was lightning in a bottle yeah. and yeah but did they do the Harry Potter also Niantic now or did yeah they, okay. I mean Niantic does the Harry Potter world which <laughs> Nobody plays. Okay. I mean, people play. I know a lot of people play it, but not. It's nowhere near as successful. Of as course. Go was, um, like, Pokemon has that collection built into it, right? Like that's one of the big things of the game. It's all <laughs> these super cute monsters that you want to go out in the world and collect, and then look a Dumbledore. Them. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> Mugs of I mean, I did, beer. I, I, I did. I did play Wizarding World for a little bit, um, and they just made choices that I didn't like. Like it was hard to play because casting spells required you to follow a certain pattern. It was really hard to do with one hand. You know, I can just flick a Pokeball and, you know, move on with my life. Um, but everything else is just like Wizarding World was really complicated and it just, it didn't feel like a great experience for me. Um, and I know a lot of people love it. Like it's still, it's still super successful. It is nowhere near what Go is and still is. Um, like they're still for as much as it's not the summer of 2016 that heyday when everybody was out in the world 2016 um, already it's four years ago yeah, already four years ago <laughs> summer of 2016 um, it's never going to be that again uh, but it is just a part of so many people's lives still and I think that's um I think that's wild for a game that is just continuing running. Like that game has been running with updates now for four years and they have no signs of stopping and they're still, it's still wildly popular. It's still fun to play. Like you can interact with it how you want. Even, even when you can't leave, uh, they've made enough changes. Like they've been, they've been really interestingly dynamic on updating and changing the game to meet the needs that I don't think a lot of other companies are able to do, especially when they get big. But it's interesting because you always think like, I think about like, okay, I'm making a company now. Like I've made a role playing game company. Now do I have to worry about who I hire and who I work with? Because I don't want it to be like, my, I, I really like this guy, but they're super problematic and down the line are going to get me into a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> like it's a it's a thing that people don't think about when you're just trying as a small company to get by. That it's also what happens if you become successful. It's also different. Just get by anymore. I've seen that even with architects, but it's also very different from being a game designer and you develop a game and it's successful, or you're an architect uh, and you design a house and suddenly you at the head of a architecture practice with 100 people or game design company with 100 people. Actually, it's not. It's not the same interests and skills whatsoever. So it's really weird. Uh, I mean, there's sort of a weird logic to it, but at the same time, it doesn't make any sense that the person who started, oh, I love designing games, who's, who's now running a company, a company because it's it's they probably doesn't don't care for that that much. But it's very difficult to give away that baby and yeah, to yeah. delegate that kind of. That kind of power. Uh, it's just we, you were talking about nine tick and how much money they make, and reminded me also an episode of Pokemon Cast when you compared what were the most profitable IPs out there, and I remember you were sort of uh, puzzled and mad that uh, Fist of the North Star, can le survivant for uh, the French listeners, uh, was one of the most <laughs> profitable IPs ever, and I believe it's because it. They have pachinko games, <laughs> so, <laughs> so they're just gambling and making a lot of money with the IP. 
it's not related to the the animation or or anything. It, yeah, the world of corporate and profit it's yeah. uh, it's a weird one. Dungeons and Dragons it's nothing compared to Pokemon. Pokemon compared nothing. to Fist of the North Star Pachinko machines, that's nothing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's always interesting. I always look at it like when you become a company, like you have to decide. And I think it's it's interesting to try to talk to people who had to do this when you decide. Do I want to stop doing the thing I love to run a business? Because like so, my friend Patrick, who who made the root board game, is you know had to make a company and become the head of that company and figure out how to juggle being a president of a company and still doing the thing that he loves, which is designing games. And that is such a weird thing to have to do because you may be a great designer, but that does not mean you're a great supervisor. Um, and I think that's, that is such a weird change to have to make, like to go from, I just want, I just like making this one thing and all I want to do is design, but then I would have to hire somebody to run my business. And then do I give that person the power to stop me from designing? Like, what does that world become? But then yeah, you manage so I, much that you don't design anymore. <laughs> you just right. supervising or all the time. Hire, you know, or do you do what a lot of businesses do and hire CEOs and presidents and then have them have to make decisions and, and to get into that power struggle of, no, I want to make this game and having a person saying, you can't do that because we need to make money. Yeah, it's money ruins everything. <laughs> <laughs> Capitalism is the worst. Be aware for what you wish for. Well, yes. uh, that was a, a long uh, but interesting tangent. Uh, but I need to go because I need to wake up my my son from his yes. nap. Uh, thank you so much, Greg, for for joining. Uh, uh, I will go back at listening to Pokemon Cast, and I, I will definitely check uh, very random encounters because the. This sort of bite-sized philosophy. Uh, it's a philosophy with a few of actual play I do on the release podcast, and uh, yeah, that's that's what I need because I cannot. Okay, uh, an episode of four hours. I cannot do that. <laughs> I tried. We're, we're, I just can't. We're we're very good at what we do. <laughs> we, our our joke right now is we we say that our gimmick is that we. Uh, randomize everything, but our real gimmick is that we're actually really good. <laughs> well, actually, I had a question uh, about that. You mentioned that, uh, well, of course, D&D, you got that many resources to randomize things. There are some games, like, I don't know, Traveler, they got a lot of stuff you can randomize. It's mm -hmm. part of the, the game at the beginning. Uh, is there any plans, or are there already available, the resources that you sort of create to be able to randomize yeah. other games? Um, if you are a Patreon, we release in our Patreon stuff people get access to all the notes and stuff that we wrote up, including our the tables that we wrote. Like, I had to write a huge document because uh, Star Wars Fantasy Flight game is completely customizable. Like, the design of that game is you build your character yourself. Uh, so I had to come up with all the charts and how to randomize all of that. So uh, people who are part of our Patreon have access to our extras folder where we put all of the stuff, the charts and stuff that we created. Um, so that you can use that if you wish. Um, so yeah, those things are available, but they are hidden slightly behind a paywall because we need to pay for storage. <laughs> well, you could create a company and sell that. <laughs> yeah, we could. I'm not. That's what I'm not doing that. I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to be a company. I'm good. Amazing. Thank you so much, Greg. Where can people find you? Um, and do you have anything else to plug uh, before you go? Uh, no, so the big things is buy my game Glitter Hearts, but if you bought the Racial Justice Bundle on itch.io, you have it. Oh, I have it! Great! Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people are like, I didn't know I had your game. I'm like, yeah, it was in there. It, with the 1,700 other games that were in there, I'm in there too. Um, you can find me on Twitter at WhiteWing, so that's the easiest way to get in touch with me. If you have any rules, questions about my game, or just want to talk to me about it, I pretty much respond to everybody. Um, you can hear me on Very Rare Encounters every Monday and also hear me on It's Super Effective, the Pokemon podcast, which also comes out every Monday. 
Um, so it's too much content to every Monday. It's too I, much content. To, you cannot listen to everything. <laughs> I know. I get a little crank. We get a little cranky when our Pokemon episodes. We've been at it for three hours, and I'm like, okay, this is too long. <laughs> you need to cut this down. I'm sick of me talking. <laughs> We've been talking about Pokemon for too long. We're done. Amazing. Well, thank you so much again. Uh, people, if you enjoyed this, please, uh, I got my own Patreon where you can find the, the audio file for this. So uh, it's a bit easier to consume if you're on your uh, currently non-existent commute, uh, despite the efforts of the government here in the UK of uh, having us engage in bad ideas. Uh, uh, I'm also... I'm I will in be America. <laughs> I can't, hold, I can't hold you up to any standards. We're in America. It's a it's a trash fire here. Yeah, but you know, it's like I don't know. It's like it's not. Yeah, it's like comparing the benef the profit of D and D to Pokemon. Uh, mm -hmm. D and D is still big, so we still have bad ideas in the UK. Even if you have way worse ideas in the US <laughs> uh, at the moment. Way <laughs> way worse ideas. Still very bad here. But uh, yeah, I will be running soon. Uh, I don't remember the dates, but check out at Albacan. It's going to be an uh, online convention, uh, normally Edinburgh-based. I will be running Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventorying, the game I am uh, designing and hopefully will put on Kickstarter someday. And uh, I would love to have a lot of new players to run that game for people quite enjoyed it and if you want to have Pokemon in that game you can do so easily and there are even random features so if you're a fan of very random encounter you might enjoy this game thank you so much uh, take care stay safe everyone thank cheers you. bye